Well, greetings, imagination connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your master of fun and wonder, your viceroy, verisimilitude, and of course, as John Campia calls me, your existential Mr. Rogers, Robert Meyer Burnett, and this is the John Campia Show Mailbag for Monday, August 1st, 2022. Now, a lot of you have noticed that I've been doing these solo for the last couple of weeks, but you know what that changes today? You know who I brought with me? I brought with me the lovely, effervescent Chris Carr. Some of you are going to say, can we see your feet? I'm going to tell you right now, no. No, no, you, you can't. Cannot. <laughs> but you know what? I'm sure she does have lovely feet. Okay. Anyway, mm, as you, you all much. know, <laughs> as you all know, during the John Campia show, we turn on the Super Chats for a very short period of time so we can answer your questions live on the show. But because John is a forward-thinking man, we have operatives all over the world that are waiting 24 hours a day, seven days a week to get comments, criticisms, anything you want to send us to that link that's right down below. And we will we will get to them here on the mailbag. And Chris Carr might answer your questions today. Maybe, just maybe. May wow, I've heard that before. <laughs> Deja so, vu. Chris, should we just jump into it? Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's All go, right. buddy. Our good friend Jonathan Namila writes in and says, hello, Rob, I just saw Nope. I walked out of this movie after an hour. What Nope is is boring, slow, not interesting at all. The trailers were mis misleading. And what did I just watch? I applicate all film history in a movie. And from a technical point, it was amazing. Chris, mm -hmm. what do you make of that? Well, I, I kind of understand this because for Nope, for me, Nope was a bit of a letdown. Mm -hmm. I went into this one expecting to be much more scared. You know how bad I am with horror movies. I'm such and a And you whim. wanted to be scared? I did want to be scared. I prepared myself mentally. I might have wow. had some aviation gin going in, Ooh. a little liquid courage. And I found I was watching two stories, the Gordy story I wanted more of, but in a separate film. And then I just found some of the things with Nope to be really interesting sci-fi elements, but it wasn't exactly what I thought was going to happen. I don't think the trailers were misleading. I think it promised sci-fi. Yeah, I mean, I think it did too. I think that Jordan Peele has Get Out. I thought was a perfect uh, blend oh, so of good. plot, messaging, and uh, uh, terror. Mm -hmm. But I think his other two films have sort of been—they haven't quite gelled. For sure, great concepts, but I'm not sure about the execution of them. Yes, and Jonathan, I mean, uh, I wish you'd stuck it out to the end. Yeah. But I understand if you didn't like it. Hey, it's always prerogative to get up and walk out. The real question is. Did you ask for your money back? I'm curious. Oh, yeah. Or did you just walk away in disgust? <laughs> Who knows? Well, we've got Garden Variety Vagabond says, Batfleck and Aquaman. Batfleck and Aquaman. Now, did you see this video that apparently uh, they were doing reshoots on the Warner Brothers lot and Jason Momoa and, and Ben Affleck like walked out together from reshoots? Yeah. And the little, the little uh, tour van they caught the, it. busted. What an exciting day for everyone on that tour. Wow. Can you believe that? That's exciting. But That's star-studded. Do you think that for sure means that he's going to be an Aquaman, or is maybe he just visiting his bro? He, Who knows? I mean, he did come in on the King's Tide, after all. That's true. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I hope they are. I hope there's some kind of a... I would love that. I, I, I like that, too. Mm -hmm. I thought it was good. I like I like their interplay. And yeah, I think they have good chemistry. And that bat cowl, come on. I agree. The best cowl. The best cowl. So, so say you. Mm-hmm. Uh, Anonymous says, hello, Rob, besides Nope that I walked out of after an hour wasting my time to build up the movie. For why, Rob? <laughs> Every movie needs to get me get their hooks in in 30 minutes if uh, so I won't uh, walk out asking for refunds. Rob, when did you walk out of a movie? Well, I think that's Jonathan again. Call me crazy. <laughs> Jonathan. Uh, you know what? I've only ever walked out of one movie in my entire life. And it was Shock Treatment, the unofficial sequel to the Rocky Horror Picture Show. I, I was so annoyed by it. You can't, you can't seek out to make a cult movie. A cult movie just happens. It has to happen. It it's an organic you, you thing, baby. You can't force it. No. Have you ever walked out of a movie, Chris? I walked out of the live action Avatar, The Last Airbender. And I did eventually finish watching it once it came, you know, to home release. But oh, oh, that movie's so painful. And you were already a, a fan of the anime. Huge fan. Massive that must have fan. been really painful. I was really hyped going into it, though. I was like, this is a lot of white people, but okay. And then watching it, 
no one knew how to pronounce their own names. Like it was, oh, it was so upsetting. Oh boy. Yeah. Yeah, the, that was the Sham Hammers, not his finest hour. Not so much. Not so bad. Mm -mm. Do you think this new live action series, do you have hope? I have hope. I have hope. I like Netflix. I think they do some really good stuff, but the original creators walking once again, mm, that does give me a red flag. Moment. As long as you have hope. Yeah. Hope springs eternal. I have big hope for the uh, uh, Sandman series. Oh my gosh, it yes. It looks good. Yeah. So I do have two for Airbender. I'd like to see it be good. That'd be nice. Be nice. <laughs> Uh, Jonathan Namella comes back and says, hello, Rob, where are the sequels to Pineapple Express? You Ooh. know what? I bet they smoked so much weed they forgot to write them. That could have happened. Yeah, well, and- Are you a Pineapple Express fan? I really enjoyed Pineapple Express. I did too. Yeah, and I, I know though that Seth Rogen has decided to not move forward with working with James Franco, so I mm. think that's part of the issue here too. Maybe they should change it to like Kumquat Express and cast some. There else. we go. Whole new stoners. There you go. I mean, why the not? Pineapple Express, a new legacy. Could very well be. I, you know, why not? Yeah. Unless he's like, if James Franco's a producer, I can see how that franchise. That could, could be if he die on the vine. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Jonathan Mella comes back again and says, "Hello, Rob. I just saw DC Super Pets. It was wonderful. Best comic book movie of the year." Well, theoretically, it's kind of an amalgamation of different comic books, but I understand what you mean. Super Pets was, Super Pets was better than Doctor Strange and Thor Love and Thunder. Damn. Chris, is that true? I still haven't seen DC Super Pets. And I was one of the few people on the show who was really excited about it. I, I haven't, haven't had time, but I'm excited about it. I, I will say Thor Love and Thunder, I did think was just kind of, a, it was it was fine. It was fine, right? Fine. It was fine. Uh, Fine's never good. Exactly, though. I was, I had very high expectations, though, of that film, and I think I let that kind of mar my my viewing experience. Because Gore the God Butcher, what a character! You know, I never used to want to want to hear uh, women that I knew say anything was just fine. Yeah, I had a great fear of that, it's especially not great. in college. Of just, oh, it's okay. Oh boy, oh, boy. <laughs> that yeah, that's just that way lies death. So, well, but Jonathan, I'm happy you liked Super Pets. Yeah. But I want to know what your favorite super pet was. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Alejandro, one of two, says, I have a theory. DC characters are more iconic than Marvel characters. And this is a curse and a blessing for DC. It's a curse because having iconic characters makes it harder to make movies where the characters are human and relatable. Something that Marvel excels at, but it's a big reason why, D why DC kills it with animation. Harley Quinn, Super Pets, Lego Batman. These work because audiences know the basic nature of all the DC characters, and that makes writing pastiches easier. It's a good question. Thoughts? Chris, what do you think about that? I mean, I'm a, I'm a make mine Marvel girl when it uh -oh. comes down to it at the end of the day. I know. This is something, this is a point of contention. We have issues. Oh. But... I think that Marvel has tons of iconic characters mm -hmm. that everyone really has part of the zeitgeist. Everyone knows Spider-Man. Everyone knows Cap America. Everyone knows Iron Man, right? In the same way that we know Wonder Woman, Superman, Batman. I think a lot of the problems have been more about the cohesion of the DCU. Not about the iconography, but about making all these different characters come together in a way that's satisfying. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, but I also think that like Spider-Man lives in the real world. Like, you know, he lives in Queens or whatever. He travels around New York. What does Superman do that's relatable? You know, he, he's not, when he, he, he puts on the mask of Clark Kent, goes into the real world. But really, I mean, if you could hear all the human beings on Earth crying out for a savior, which is what he says in Superman Returns, you know, I can understand how, I mean, I once heard that the DC characters are the gods and the Marvel characters are the demigods. Ooh. You know, I know that, yes, I know Thor's an Asgardian and all that, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you've got these godlike figures in, in Wonder Woman, so they're, and Superman and Aquaman, but they're kind of less relatable. I mean, the Marvel, the mutants are just, you know, outcasts. They're they're people you, like, they're drama club kids that you knew in high and school. And I found them very relatable for uh, that reason. <laughs> there you go. So, yeah, I mean, I, but I think that's a pretty decent analysis. Yeah, I can totally understand it. I get that. Mm -hmm. I'll buy that. Sam Fisher says, maybe a strange question. There are no strange questions. Maybe a strange question, but what is your favorite TV show episode naming convention or pattern? One of mine is Psych, which had a very punny or referential or funny thematic episode name like Autopsy Turvy. That's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Or Chivalry is not dead, but someone is. Ooh. Uh, 
That's pretty great, Sam. Um, what do you think about that? I, I mean, I'm trying conventions? to think of a show that did that. Psych was so good. Were you a fan of that? I did like Psych. I loved Psych. I loved Timothy Robinson. I think yeah. he's so wonderful and so underrated. What a great character actor. But I love those names. I mean, Friends had the one with the, the one with the one, the one of Jessica Jones did AKA whatever. Bob's yep. Burgers. Oh, Bob's Burgers does they have do great have names. Those puns. Yeah, they do. that's true. You know, naming conventions. I mean. I don't know about necessarily naming conventions like that. I just like shows like I have to go back to the original Star Trek that just had great episode titles like Who Mourns for Adonais or the animated series How Sharper Than a Serpent's Tooth. Oh, Batman the Animated Series. Great show names. Great show names. And they all just sound like iconic bits of literature, basically. I love that. Ugh, so good. I think that's great. But I love, you know what? Those kinds of conventions make a TV show to me more fun. Mm -hmm. Like I love when... I, I love t television episode titles. They're 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 great. It's important. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. So anonymous says, "What show was the biggest disappointment? Obi Wan or Picard?" Oh, Ooh. Picard, one hundred percent. Obi Wan. Really? Yes. Obi Wan was more disappointing than the shit show that was Picard seasons season one and two. Uh, season one of Picard, I think, was great. Did I get bored in season two? Yes, I did. Sorry. I know. I know you're not going to agree with me on this. You were so mad about Obi-Wan. You know what, though? The thing about Obi-Wan is that ultimately there was enough in it that I liked. It just, okay. I just didn't like the way it was always, it was presented. I thought it could have been presented. And if you look at that fan cut of Obi-Wan, yes. where he, he pared it down into a, a movie and got rid of a lot of the things that made it kind of dumb, Yeah, I think it worked. Whereas I, I thought Picard season one and two were just unmitigated disasters, mostly because Patrick Stewart, here's why I dislike Picard as much as I did. Okay. It was Patrick Stewart bringing Patrick Stewart to the big screen, as opposed to bringing the character of Jean-Luc Picard. Oh. There was too much of Patrick Stewart himself in that character. And I, that has happened with both Brent Spiner and Patrick Stewart over the course of time uh, with Star Trek, when they want to bring their real world selves into the show. Mm -hmm. And I think it detracts from their characters. Okay. And I thought that, I mean, Picard opens with him. Jean-Luc Picard is kind of disgraced. He's mad at Starfleet and he's sitting in his chateau writing books. Come on, man. That is not what Jean-Luc Picard oh, would do. I liked it, though, sitting there making his wine. And I like that we saw different variations of Brett Spiner. I don't know. I, I'm not going to win the Star Trek argument with you. May Season three, though. Season three is supposed See, to be. Look, uh, the, the, perhaps for me, the greatest turnaround in television history mm -hmm. is season three of Picard. Showrunner Terry Metalis knocked it out of the park. He was the sole showrunner and created something that I think is one for the ages. I'm and really that's to see some that. of the best Star Trek character exchanges ever. Damn. And for me to say that, that's a let lot. me tell you, that's a <laughs> lot of money they had to pay me. A lot. No, no So many paid, hot toys. No one no one paid me any money, I swear. <laughs> uh the Sky Blaze. They didn't, I swear to God, no one paid me any money. The Sky Blaze says Thor 4. More Thors. Gore Wars, Lords Gord, Norse Shores, Horse Soars, Lores Ignored, Gore Galore. I liked I, that more than the movie. I, You know what? I got to give it up. Yeah, you know what? Let, well bring done. that back, Jonathan. Well done. Could you read that in a voice? What voice? Any voice. I you don't know. You want me to chipmunk it? Yeah. Thor, Thor, more Thors, Gore Thors, Thors, uh, Lords Gord, Norse Shores, Horse Soars, Lores Ignored, Gore Galore. Woo -woo. God, I love when you do that. <laughs> It's better than her feet. It doesn't do well in the bedroom. I'm, I'm not going to lie. It's pretty good. I'm like, Lord, and he's like, get away from me. <laughs> I love that. I love your voices. And thanks for just performing. No problem. No Jesus. problem. That's good. Yeah. See what happens when I bring friends to do the mailbag with yeah. me? Mass hysteria. <laughs> um, a silly goose. One of how many? Oh, I see what we did there. Okay, here we go. Okay, a silly goose. The Hobbit love continues. Another one of my favorite scenes in the trilogy is when Thorin is dying and says to Bilbo, if more people valued home above gold, this world would be a merry place. Enough to make this silly old goose tear up. Also, in the last mailbag, you mentioned the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit physical media. I've got the 4K Steelbook box sets of both trilogies, you and I. Park our shuttlecrafts in the same shuttle bay. They are the crown jewels of my physical media collection. I'd bet my bottom dollar you have them as well. Have a good one, boss. Well, you know what? A silly goose. 
I do have both. And they're not the only sets of those 4Ks I have because <laughs> I'm that nutty. But I have to say that those box sets, the Steelbooks, are beautiful and they look great on the shelf. And they look Amazing. great. The movies look great. Yeah, I, I know I give you shit about physical media. Playfully, I will add, it's I'm okay. not actually mad about it, you guys. But the, that is physical media that I own. Those beautiful, beautiful compilations. I love Lord of the Rings. They're, well, they're great. Yeah. And, and the transfers look great, even though there's a few mistakes. I know people bitch, but for the most part, they look and sound amazing. Mm -hmm. That's all that matters, yeah. really. Uh, Devin says, hey, John and Rob. No. John Chris. Chris. And Rob. Or Chris. <laughs> Sorry. She doesn't even know. I'm sitting right next to her. Who are you? Who is this guy? Oh. Uh, wait, I didn't get to read this. <laughs> hey, Chris and Rob. Long time since I commented in a mailbag. I started wondering, speculating, what if maybe in one of the new Avengers films coming up, Sam Wilson... New Cap says the iconic line once again, Avengers assemble. Well, that would be badass. What do you think? Is that going to happen? I hope it does. We need to pay Sam Wilson some respect, goddammit. Right now, I think we are undermining him being captain. I, I do too. I really want him front and center owning that title. We had a whole series of him fighting to accept it himself. I need other people to accept him in this role too. And what better way than to heed the call? You know, I mean, exactly. I, and, and I look, I think, I think when Sam Wilson says it, it needs to be emphatic. It needs to be loud. And he has to swoop in, you know, with the shield aerially and, and as he's flying over his army or whatever, because mm -hmm. they're fighting the sequel wars. Yeah. And he says, Avengers! You know, assemble. It's got to be loud, and yeah. I gotta. I, I mean, I want to feel it. I want to feel the rumble in the theater when he says it, and I want everybody to just stand up as we, as if we're part of his army. Hell yeah! Like, I mean, that's what I want. Absolutely, he deserves it. Like you said, he does. He's worked his hard. He's worked mm -hmm. hard for the money and the shield. <laughs> Arush, uh, a rush, says after Oppenheimer, could Christopher Nolan direct the new James Bond movie? I know he has mentioned how he would love to make one, but only if they were able to do something new and unique with it. Well, with the new Bond, I would say these stars might just align. You know, it's funny because I do think that uh, Inception was his Honor Majesty's Secret Service, kind of. But as long as they gave him control, uh, I don't know if the Broccoli's, well, if Barbara and Michael Wilson would do it. But, I mean, come on. He what? basically, his whole, his whole career is an audition for making a Bond exactly. movie. Exactly. And why wouldn't you let him try? I don't know. That Are you a Bond great. fan? I love Bond. Do you have a favorite Bond? Okay, I get made fun of a lot for this, but remember how old I am and video games. Uh, Pierce Brosnan was mine because I loved GoldenEye and that game. Well, oh, yeah, and so you know, good. there had been no Bond movies. That was the longest stretch at the time mm -hmm. of no Bond movies from 89 to 95. And we, we had Timothy Dalton. We left him behind. And six years yep. later, we got Pierce Brosnan. He was great. I thought it was wonderful. When I, I would always watch um, reruns of uh, Sterling. Gosh, what was his show? Where it was the um, detective oh, uh, show? Remington Steel. Remington Steel. Thank you. My mom would play it for me. And I just was so in love with great. him. Oh, it's great. Love Remington Steel. So good. Fantastic. All right. Uh, John D says, hey, what's a film that most sent you into an existential crisis? I just finished a ghost story, ooh, and that film floored me and left me contemplating existence for days. Fun times. Thanks. That's a very interesting, quiet film that would put you into an existential spin. Have you ever been put into an existential crisis because of a movie? I don't know if I have from a movie. There's definitely films I've walked out of. I'm like, oh, this is going to sit with me for a long time, and I'm very unsettled. Um, Ex Machina was one of those for me where I was like, oh, my God, what is mm. life? Um, so I guess that. I don't know. I'm a millennial. We're constantly feeling existential dread. Every waking moment is just like, ugh. <laughs> wow. Is that true? Are I, all millennials feeling existential dread I don't want to speak for all of us, but probably. Wow. Okay. That's, that's good insight. I, what about you? You know what? I have to say the last movie that sent me into an existential spin was Inception Ooh, because I just broken up with this girl that I was madly in love with who she just didn't like me as much as I liked her and it was hard to deal with. But, and then she started dating a friend of mine. <gasps> and, and so I started going to Inception because I, first of all, I love the movie. I saw it eight times in the theater, but I kept going because it, it, it was, it was about Leonardo DiCaprio's loss of his wife. You know, Marion Cotillard, he, he loved her so much. She was gone, and he could never get her back. And then one night, I went to the arc light and saw my ex-girlfriend with her new boyfriend. Mm. That was actually kind of great because this existential, this this angst that I've been feeling was just reiterated, and I got to take that in 
to like my seventh viewing of Inception, and it kind of made the movie better. Did it give you closure ultimately afterwards? Oh, no. It just made me angry. Oh, no. <laughs> but it was good. It was an existential anger. I got to shout at God for a while when I was driving home. Well, and then you ended up with like the best gal. So That's true. It Years all later. Out. Yeah. I had to go through a lot of detours. But yes, things work out. Yeah. They work out. Mm, the broken the road. End. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> and now, the sponsor of this segment mm -hmm. of the John Campy Show mailbag. Actually, you love I story love blocks. story blocks. I use them for all of the demos I create for my students and everything. And Ray uses them for all the sound effects that Storyblocks has. <laughs> yep. So let's hear it <laughs> from Storyblocks. We want to take a moment and thank the sponsor of today's video, Storyblocks. Guys, I have been an enthusiastic fan and user of Storyblocks for years. I go to them whenever I'm in need of content creation assets like royalty-free music, video clips, or templates for my creative projects, ranging anywhere from little editorial videos to my very own full feature documentary. Storyblocks helps you bring your stories, videos, and projects to life without sacrifices due to time, budget, or access to resources. They have over 1 million different story assets, ranging from stock videos, audio and music, an in-browser video editor, and they feature pre-designed templates, animations, and outros. Storyblocks uses an affordable subscription model and their unlimited access plans offers, well, unlimited video and audio downloads rather than a costly pay-per-clip model. With Storyblocks, you'll be able to create more content and more importantly, better content, all while using a subscription plan that fits your budget, utilizing unlimited downloads of demand-driven and diverse content. So if you're interested in upping your content creation game, head over to W www.storyblocks.com slash campia and get started today. That's www.storyblocks.com slash campia. And thank you to Storyblocks for sponsoring this episode of the John Campia Show Mailbag. Chris, I can't wait to see what's next. Let's go. Boris. Whenever I see Boris, I think of Boris the Spider, the Who song. Oh, I think of Boris and Natasha from Rocky and Bullwinkle. Mm, there you go. Okay, that's two different types of people in the world. Uh, I know, but you know what? I, uh, <laughs> both references about the same time. That's true. Pretty good. Pretty mm -hmm. good. Not mm -hmm. bad. You don't have to be millennial to get that. <laughs> hey, John or Rob or Chris or Rob, hope you're well. I had a small theory about the Black Panther trailer. Do you think Wakanda could be copping flat flack? post blip and for not stopping Thanos, not involving the world. She seemed like she was stating her case. That's really interesting. Ooh. Like once the, once Wakanda has made itself known as we know at the end of black Panther, mm -hmm. does the world then give Wakanda an inordinate amount of responsibility for what's happening in the world? Like if Wakanda, since you're the most powerful nation, you should fix this. Yeah. That's an, that, what do you think of that idea? I mean, there, that possibly could be it because that could be a flashback, right? Because I've lost all of my family. Is yep. that about T'Challa or is that about, you know, them being, you know, dusted by Thanos? Yeah. We're not sure yet. But it does feel like something that would happen at a UN meeting is like, and we blame you for not stepping up to the plate here. And after all, he was in Wakanda. Thanos was in Wakanda when exactly. he snapped his fingers. That's a real, I like, I mean, I like that theory. I could see at least half the planet blaming Wakanda for the snap. Mm -hmm. I never thought about that. That's a really interesting, I like that. Interesting yeah. theory. Uh, could make for some great political machinations or mm -hmm. something. David G says, hey, Robert John or Chris, one of the most underrated films to me is Jet Li in Fearless. Great action and character arc. The end fight scenes with Tanaka is perfect. The music at the end while chanting gave me goosebumps. I loved the mutual respect shown at the end. I have not seen that in a long time. It's one of Logan's favorites. Is it really? Yeah, my husband loves the shit out of this movie. Wow, and do you agree with this? I've never seen it. I'm a bad wife. Wow. Yeah. But do you show him your feet? I mean, he has seen my feet. We're married, Rob. <laughs> oh, you never know. I, mean, I, <laughs> I keep my shoes on uh, at uh, all times. If we can make Ray laugh, I think that's... Uh, <laughs> laugh. By the way, Ray, it's, uh, it's your birthday. Happy birthday, Happy Ray. Happy birthday, Ray. Does everyone know that it's Ray Ora's birthday today? <laughs> 21 years old. <laughs> That's my goal. If he laughs during a mailbag, I've done my I've done my job. I don't remember the film. I saw it once. So I'm just gonna take our viewer's word for yeah. it. Yeah. Chris Chris Mathy says Lego did not spoil. 
The new sequel sets are labeled Wakanda Forever. The set of discussion is labeled Black Panther. It refers to the scene in the first movie where Shuri is testing the Black Panther suit. I think the secret is safe. Thoughts? I think you just spoiled everything, although you're saying it didn't. <laughs> uh, okay, you know, maybe that, you know what? The idea that she's testing the Black Panther suit, I could buy that. Like she, you know, she's she's manufactured a new suit and she's just out there seeing it, taking it through its paces. Yeah, but I mean, it's specced for a specific human, and I feel like Shuri and T'Challa have pretty different builds. So she's just like, all right, gonna put on my brother's onesie and see how this works. Poo poo. I don't know. Maybe she's just working out. You know, and she's maybe, and she grew a foot. Could be. I don't know. It, have you ever tried to put on somebody else's onesie, Rob? Uh, I never have. Maybe an underoos when I was a kid, but mm. I I don't remember. It's not it's not person to person. It's not that easy. If there's a f like foot difference between you, you can't borrow my Charizard one. So you don't think she's just putting the suit through its paces? You really think that I she's going like, to be the new Black I, Panther? I feel like she is one of the people who probably is going to try to step up to the plate. Well, if that's the case, then our viewer is incorrect, and Lego did spoil I think the surprise. I think Lego spoiled it a little bit. I think bit. they did, too, frankly. There's I mean, I love Lego. Before. Yeah. I'm sorry, viewer. I think but it's that, a good um, theory. Maybe you're right. Maybe I have egg on my face. Hmm. Could be. Yeah. Well, we'll see when the movie comes yeah. out. <laughs> Proof's in the pudding. Miguel Zayan uh, said, hola, Rob. Hope you are well. I just saw nope. And I thought it was very interesting and entertaining. I feel like Peel is flexing his skills on big spectacle filmmaking, and he's showing it off in this film. Laugh out loud. Good allegorical story with great acting. Thoughts? Well, I, I agree with all of that. I mean, I think he's doing a, a tremendous job. I think he's a world-class filmmaker. I do think that his writing, um, like I loved Get Out. Mm -hmm. I thought that the messaging and I thought the plotting of the movie, I thought the acting was great it all worked us i was with until halfway through where it 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 strained credulity asking me to believe in this base with clones of the entire yeah uh, it just i was like wait a minute the entire world is basically disneyland it's the magic kingdom we're all living on the second floor yeah i just had a problem i couldn't i couldn't hang with that yeah. i didn't because and they just abandoned that base they made all those people and left Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess that was an allegory for God, absentee landlord, who knows? I don't know. And I felt that Nope was a, was better than us, but still his messaging was slightly muddled. But who am I to say? I mean, he made a movie and I didn't. So, yeah. but I, 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 I'm looking forward to his next one. Absolutely. And I will say the scale of this was beautiful. Yeah. And seeing this on a big screen is something to behold. I mean, just the design of what we're looking up at the sky in is beautiful. The acting is fantastic. I mean, yeah. Kiki Palmer in particular. Well, his is casting so good. is impeccable. He, mm -hmm. he does a great job uh, casting actors. Yeah. So, I mean, he's a great filmmaker. Look, even if I don't think his movies are entirely successful, they certainly. Uh, leave me with questions and Absolutely. I ponder them. They they leave they leave a mark. Whether you love them or not, they do leave a mark. And when you walk away, there's a lot to ponder. And I think that means it's a win. For sure. You know, it, not everything has to be perfect. Mm -hmm. All right. The filthy fella. The filthy fella says, Hey Rob and or John and or Chris. My favorite films of all time are the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Absolute perfection. I'm excited for Rings of Power, but I feel like no matter what, I'll be let down because of the quality of the original. What do you think? And bring on the filthy. What do you think, Chris? I'm so hyped for Rings of Power. I mean, honestly, when we just saw the posters of their hands, I lost my mind. Right. I was freaking out so hard. This, I, I've said it before, everyone on the show could just describe grass for the entirety of the season. And I'd be like, this is so Tolkien. Tol Tol I love this so much. I have high hopes. I think everything looks beautiful. It looks so cinematic. I think they had the right people involved. The budget's bananas. And you can see it in the footage, the very limited footage we have gotten. I'm hyped. No, I, I mean, I'm, I'm excited to see it too. But I, I, the thing about the Lord of the Rings that I think is such a tough act to follow is the Lord of the Rings is essentially a story of the end of the world. Yeah. It's the story of the apocalypse, and it's hard to come up with bigger stakes than that. Like, obviously, this leads up to the first War of the Ring, which is kind of the same thing. It could have been the end of the world, but the characters didn't necessarily know it as much. Maybe some did, some didn't. I don't know. Um, but I, I just have a feeling, 
And also, the Lord of the Rings was already written. You know, you had the character voices, and they could look at Tolkien's work and go, okay, well, here's how so-and-so sounds. These characters didn't have Tolkien's voice, and I mean literally in their mouths. So hopefully the writing is great. Mm -hmm. It'll be a great show, but I have high hopes too. Yeah. I hope it's great. Uh, Suthius, one of two, our old friend Suthius. After watching the Imagineering story and light and magic on Disney+, Plus, I've come to the self-appointed epiphany, if you will, that George Lucas, Walt Disney, and John Campia are one and the same. <laughs> Follow me here. Lucas had a knack for bringing certain talents together that would bring his vision to fruition. What he did for the film industry, Disney did the same for the theme park industry. And what they did for their respective fields, Mr. C has done for film punditry over the last 11 years or so. Ooh. Well, Suthius, I think that's a very astute uh, observation. And John, you know, I think John does have clearly... I'm representative of this, that and so are you, he Chris Carr. Great talent. I mean, if you look at the he two of us, such good talent. You we're, guys, we're we're the absolute <laughs> like embodiment of of John Campia's understanding of where talent really lies. Great hiring skills. So I right mean, here. just look at right here. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic. So I think uh, you're absolutely right. But you know what, though, <laughs> I'll tell you something. In all in all seriousness, uh, a, a vision visionaries who know how to find good people to prop up their vision is a, is a great skill mm -hmm. for, for, for any industry or any, 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 um, endeavor where you can't do things on your own. You have to bring like-minded people together and not only do they have to be good, they have to be able to work with all the other people that you hire as exactly. well, which is also a, a, a skill. And, um, I think John does a pretty good job of that. He does. He does. Except when we fight like cats and dogs off screen. Well, yeah. We're putting on a good, a we good uh, show for the camera. We stand each other off yeah. screen. It's oh. true. Man. Mm. Can I tell you a weird Disney fact? Because yes. I was a Disney intern. Oh, okay. Um, so Walt would follow people at the park to see how long it would take them to discard their trash. And that's how he decided to space out trash cans based on how many steps average people would just go, I don't want this anymore. And so that's why there's trash cans about every like 15 to 20 feet in the parks. Wow. Like that attention to detail is wild. That is why he was such a visionary. Mm -hmm. He would have redesigned American cities if he could have done uh, Epcot the way he wanted oh, to yeah. in the 60s. Could have transformed so cool. uh, uh, cities around the world, actually. Mm -hmm. Very sad that he didn't get a chance to do that. Sam Fisher says, when someone writes a song, specifically the lyrics, into a book or piece of writing, does the writer need to pay royalties to the songwriter or for the song rights? Like famously in Good Omens, the tape tech in Crowley's Bentley turns any tape into queen. Well, here's the thing. You can write anything that you want. Like you can write it down in a book. You can mention queen songs. Mm -hmm. If you are going to reprint lyrics, you either have to give accreditation or you have to... I don't think you necessarily have to pay if you just write it yeah, down. You definitely do once it goes to screen. If it goes to screen, if somebody says the lyric, if somebody sings the lyric, if you're going to repurpose that lyric, you absolutely have to to do that. Yeah, that's one of my favorite details in that book, too. I love that, of just anything in the tape deck. Oh, it's great. That book is great. It's if so you haven't good. read Good Omens, oh. it's such a good book. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I thought I thought the show was okay. I, I loved it. the show. Yeah, it was it was a great adaptation. I'm, I'm a big David Tennant fangirl, oh. though. I love Broadchurch. <sighs> so that good. was good. Oh. Really good. Man, I enjoyed it. Uh, Verisimilitude Junior. All right. Hello, Rob. I'm 18, and I've never watched The Lord of the Rings, <laughs> but I want to get into them. Should I start by watching the original versions or go straight to the extended cuts? Should I watch the Hobbit trilogy before or after the original trilogy? Thanks. Well, this is a good. I have I have thoughts on this, but I go to you first. Oh, Should they man. watch the theatrical or the extended versions? I want the extended versions. I would say yes, because here's the thing: the the theatrical versions are actually the compromised versions because uh, Peter Jackson agreed to release films under a certain length, mm -hmm. knowing that he was going to be able to put in these longer scenes and i think that the extended versions are the definitive versions however oh. there's things in the extended version of return of the king that i think make it too long 
Well, that's and, fair. And I think that there's a there was a whereas I think that the extended versions of Fellowship and and Two Towers are brilliant. Mm -hmm. I think that there's a compromise somewhere between the theatrical because Return of the King is like an hour longer. Yeah. Well, and I think that's because in those first two, you're getting just a lot more lore and world building. Yes. Whereas the third one, you're getting a lot more with the characters, which is great. Yes. But that movie already ends five times in the theatrical. So it can be tightened up. Now, what about The Hobbit? I mean, obviously the book, The Hobbit, came before Lord of the Rings. Yes. But the book was short and sweet and to the point. And a children's story at the end of the day. And a children's story. Whereas the movies were... I think there's a lot to like in the Hobbit movies, but I find them to be overblown. And I think that the tone is all over the place. I agree with that. I also am not a big fan of the use of CGI so much in that film. I love the practicality yep. of the Lord of the Rings films. That always bummed me out. If you do want to watch it for that linear storytelling, you can absolutely do that way. I honestly think watching the Lord of the Rings first and then going back is a little more fun because then you pick up those little notes. Yes. Um, and then if you want to get really wild, watch the 1970s animated film. Yeah, the Ralph Bakshi animated yeah. version only tells you the first half of Lord of the Rings. So it ends like in the middle of Two Towers yeah. somewhere. I haven't seen that in ages. It's it's so weird. And it, it was all rotoscoped animation. So yeah, it's, it's not, so uncomfy to watch. Yeah, it's it's weird. Yeah, it's uh, but it's got a great score. It does. I love the score. Mm -hmm. Not as good as Howard Shore's score, but no. it's good. Uh, from Mexico. From Mexico with love, I fly to you. Hola. Have you guys gotten a chance to watch Ethan Hawke's HBO Max docu-show about Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward, The Last Movie Stars? It's incredible. Hawk is a true artist in every sense of the word. Can't rec recommend it enough. Saludos. Have you seen it? I haven't yet. My friends who have watched it talked about how they were bawling by the end of it. Yeah, he I has haven't... actors playing, like George Clooney plays Paul Newman. Oh. And they're like are reading these letters. And Ethan Hawk, you know, he's a novelist. He he's a true he truly is an artist. I think this Absolutely. is a really I really want to see this. Yeah. I haven't seen it. Yet I just either. haven't been emotionally ready for it. Because I yeah. love those actors. Yeah, I did too. Oh. And they were married for a long yeah, time. It's I mean, one of the most were... beautiful Hollywood love stories. True, true, uh truly great. I mean, to me, when I think movie stars, I think them. Like Absolutely. there's uh, Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, mm -hmm. Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward. I mean, they're they're kind of I you know. Yeah. And then um a Hugh Hugh Hume uh, Hugh Hume Cronin and Jessica Tandy. Oh. Or two others, mm -hmm. the, a love beyond all time, or whatever. Yeah, whatever that is. Oh my gosh, mm. whatever that is, whatever love is. Bleh. I want to <laughs> know what love is amongst movie stars because there's not a lot of it. There isn't. Um, yeah. So what are we gonna do? Darren Barnes says hi, Rob. I always wanted to know what the red digital screen is showing on the clapperboard. Oh, what the? Oh, oh, pardon me. Hi, Rob. I've always wanted to know what the red digital screen is showing on the clapperboard. What does it do? Is it the hours or minutes of film production? How was this done prior to digital slates? Okay, what's really interesting about the slate board, what a slate board used to do, it, it served a number of, of purposes. First of all, you would write, the numbers you would write are the scene and take number. And, and then when you actually used the clapperboard, click, that was a sync point yep. where the editors could sync up the sound and picture together when they were in editorial. In the digital world, now you have, it, it's called jam syncing or whatever. The actual numbers usually correspond to audio, um, depending on how it's, how it's linked up. So the, it's an actual, um, uh, it, it, it's digital. So you've actually got it marked on whatever, whether you're recording a file, whether you're recording it on a, a, a not a Nagra, but a digital recorder of mm -hmm. some kind. And and on the picture, it's it gives you an actual number that you can also sync to. Exactly. So you it, it, it's it's um, it's just more information. But basically, scene and take numbers, and it helps you whether it's old school or new school. It helps you sync sound yeah. and picture. That's why you'll hear people right before it too doing the sound speed check to make sure all of that is rolling as well in addition to the camera rolling. Yes. And then we get everything off to the races at the same time. And like I'll give you an example. When you are editing digitally and you have the software will use that information and it can you can just hit a button and it will sync up your picture and sound for you when you start editing. Yeah. Which is awesome because you used to have to do it by hand even in the computer. Uh, and it was a pain in the ass. And so helpful if you end up having to do ADR 
Oh my gosh, which already is such an ass ache having to dub over somebody's mouth flaps. It's literally what it's called is yep. matching the mouth flaps. And having that syncopation at the bottom where you can see all the numbers, it makes it so much easier. So much easier. Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, it is a great question. A great question. Uh, Nermus Aurelius Maximus says hello to the entire crew. In the recent She-Hulk trailer, did you notice the California Republic flag in the courtroom with the shapeshifter? Does She-Hulk take place in California? And could this mean a nod to the West Coast Avengers? Ooh. Oh, that's a good question. What do you think? I didn't even notice the flag. I was not paying attention to enough stuff in the background. I was just like, Jennifer, what's up? Hi, you're pretty. That's really interesting. I mean, I never it never occurred to me. I just figured that if there's a Bureau of Superhero Affairs are they national? But lawyers don't have national accreditation, do well, they? They can't. Please yep. correct me if I'm wrong, too. The In the comics, the actual law firm of, you know, JLK, all that, was in New York. Right. I mean, that's where most things took place. But, I mean, I don't see that why there's any reason why we wouldn't go to, I, to California. Yeah, I mean, I hear that there's a scene, I've been told, that where they actually go to Marvel. Like the Marvel offices out here. Oh, I love that. So, uh, you know, that uh, maybe it does take place here in California. That'd be I mean, cool. Yeah, why not? I mean, I know they shot it here. I was going to say. So, well, that could be. That's sharp. You are a sharp eyed yeah. viewer. And that'd be really cool if it did lead to a, lead to a West Coast Avengers. Oh, man, that'd I'd be love super that. Fun. Moon Knight joining the West Coast Avengers. We got to figure out what the heck's going on with Moon Knight I, first. Yeah, I don't even know when I watch that series. Yeah. What's going on with him? I don't know. Um, Jeffrey L. says, first, it was my mother, then my wife, then my son's future mother-in-law, and now Ray. Happy birthday to all. Oh, what a good day for birthdays. Aw. Hear that, Ray? People love you, man. They do. That's because Ray Orr is a man of the people. Everyone you are a man him. of the people. Yeah. Ray, you. are you having a good birthday so far? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Happy birthday to Ray. Yeah. That's all we got? Well, that's it. Chris, what a fun time it was being with you today. Thanks here. for having me on. This is fun. Do you like doing the mailbag? I love doing the mailbags with you. I like doing anything with you, Rob. We have a good time. Easy. Just Easy. Hey, man. She oh, likes me because I don't ask to see her feet. It's very true. It's true. <laughs> you know, you always have shoes on just for everybody who wants to know. Yes, she does. Uh, well, thank you for joining me on this mailbag. It was a lot of Anytime. fun. It's a lot of fun. And I want to thank, of course, Ray Ora for mm -hmm. there, and of course, Jonathan Voico for producing this mailbag. Yeah. Uh, Chris, where can people find you online? Oh, you can find me at, at actor Chris Carr on Twitter or Instagram. You can also find my voiceover studio, Speak Friends Studio on Instagram. Um, and I also teach classes. So just hit me up, guys, if you ever want to know more about voiceover or cutting your own voiceover demos. And I, of course, am Robert Meyer Burnett. You can find me on Instagram at RM Burnett. Find me on Twitter at Burnett RM or find me at postgeeksingularity.com. Such a How, good name. You like that? I love it. I made it. that up. God. Now I can use it, monetize so it. So brilliant. Well, thank you. Thank Mad you. about Wait, it. What did you just say? So brilliant. Gosh, love you can that. clip that out and use it. It's true. <laughs> now remember, if you want to get your questions, comments, or anything else on the mailbag, that link right down below. Or you can join us every single weekday during the John Campy Show, beginning at 10.30 a.m., Monday through Friday, Pacific time, of course. Mm -hmm. And we can uh, answer your Super Chat questions. Do you think you're going to come back this week and join me for another mailbag? Probably, if the boss allows it. I think that'd be great. Yeah. We'll just have to bully him into it. Yeah. Well, thanks very much, everybody.